Hi, my name's John. And I'm Allie. And when we finished season two of Fruits Basket, we thought it would be a fun idea to look back at season one and talk about all the cool details that we may have missed from an anime only and a manga reader's perspective. So join us today as we talk about season one, episode two. They're all animals. Welcome back to another episode of our Fruits Basket podcast. So if you like this kind of content, you want to see more of it coming from the channel, make sure to like the video, subscribe, and why aren't even ringing that notification bell so you never miss another upload looking at all the episodes from season one. But with all of that out of the way, where are we starting? Okay, so I saw some people in our Discord, which by the way, you should join our Discord, who hey. were a little confused and they thought that this was going to be, like if they were watching season one for the first time that they could watch these videos, no, no, no. It's a retrospective. Yeah. So yeah. this has spoilers from season two. Do not watch this video until you have watched all of season two. Then you yes. can watch this. And follow along if you like, because that's cute. Okay. Yeah, that's super fun. <laughs> yeah, but after that, for the actual episode, we start yes. out and we have Toru, and she learns about the curse right in the beginning. And, you know, she takes Ooh. that surprisingly well. <laughs> yeah, so just... <laughs> I don't know. If I were an individual and the three people around me whom I had just met, the second I touched them, they like poofed into animals, I would be like, <laughs> yo dog, <laughs> I'm out. Literally like, yo dog, yo cat, yo rat. No, stop. <laughs> no. <laughs> stop. No. But yeah, she's had a lot of stuff going on in her life, so... Maybe she's just so desensitized to everything right now in the world. This is small fish for her. Honestly, like after her becoming friends with Hanajima, who has wave powers, maybe it's true. not that surprising. But like Hanajima, you can't really like see the wave powers, you know? You just hear about them from her. You're not like yeah. seeing someone turn into an animal. The next thing I have as a note is Kill being a big ol' softy the whole freaking episode. Oh my goodness. So when he like breaks the table, right? Mm -hmm. And like it springs up and makes Toru bleed, his face is... So at first I was just like, oh, he's like shook that that happened. Like he was surprised. Like that was my initial reaction when I first started season one. But I didn't really think much of it. But there is so much... <laughs> in that like small little frame that with the context of season two i'm like oh, oh boy oh boy <laughs> when you watch season one the first time and you're just like okay yeah taking in the information and now that you've watched season two every single frame has to be digested in a different way yeah now that i have this context and seeing that look of him hurting Toru, like, essentially the second they meet, I think he knows who she is. Oh. Straight from the outset, I think, because we know we've established that Kyo had a relationship with Kyoko. It's my theory that they were together at the time of her death, and he, that is something that he actively witnessed, right? That is your theory. I think that the second he sees Toru, all of that kind of like rushed back into his head. And because I think he blames himself for Kyoko's death, the second he sees her daughter and interacts with her daughter in person, he immediately hurts her and makes her bleed. Like, that's what that look was to me. Look of absolute shock. What are you, some kind of psychologist? Um, no. <laughs> I'm studying to be a counselor. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take your theory. Because we do know that he's seen a photo of Toru, and that he yes. he was snooping on her through a window. He saw her yeah. sitting there, but mm -hmm. that that's all we know. So, I mean, using, using the puzzle pieces that you have, I understand how you got this picture. So I'll take yeah. it. Yeah. I think he has to know who she is. I did like his look. It was very cute. And mm -hmm. he, oh, he's just so panic. Like, just... Mm -hmm. Oh, Toru and panic and how to talk to Toru and then more panic and it's really yeah. cute. I, I, I miss this Kyo. I did. And his anxiety manifests in so much just anger and he doesn't know how to 
express or communicate with her. Again, I think probably because of the guilt of the situation with her mother. I think that guilt is what manifests him just like, screaming at her at every step of the way. At least initially, you know. <laughs> we know he grows and they fall in love, but they don't want to admit that they love each other by the end of season two. And, ooh, it's cute. But, like, right now. Mm -hmm. Another boy who starts off a little different and grows is Yuki. And something that stood out to me this episode is his body language. Because it is ooh, so close yes. off. And I remember when we started season two and you were looking at one of the openings. I think it was the beach arc opening one. Yeah. Yeah. And you were analyzing yep. that and you said, oh, Yuki's body language is so closed off. And I was mm -hmm. like, okay, true. But I don't think that's a theme for him. It is. He does it so much in this episode. Yeah. And it's so like in his initial like artwork and so much throughout every context that he's in. He always has, he's always using his one arm to grab his other and covering his chest. So always protecting himself whenever he's interacting with anyone because he's never truly been able to open up, really. And so having this opportunity to do so is surreal moving forward because I think it's, <laughs> spoiler, next episode when they kind of uh, do the whole hideout thing, right? I think so, yeah. And seeing the lead up to that is so cool where he's just within himself. And even his interactions with her are very characterized by, he's very cold, he's very kind of calculated, like keeping her at arm's length throughout the episode. Yeah, okay, question. I, I know that mm. you might not know everything about body language, but you, you know more than I do. Mm. <laughs> I've heard that People protect themselves in two ways when they're like anxious like that with their body language. If they protect their back, it's because they're afraid of things and people that they can't see. Like they think that someone's gonna like stab them in the back kind of thing. But if they protect mm. their front, it's because people have insulted them to their face so much that they're like trying to protect themselves from people who are outward with their emotions of hatred. So I don't know if that's yeah. true, but- no. A hundred percent it is. Oh, cool. Yeah, because people because... have always been very upfront with Yuki about their hatred of him and things and like mm -hmm. insulting him to his face. He doesn't protect his back because he gets it to his front. I've worked with, like in a professional capacity, a lot of people who feel incredibly uncomfortable with anyone standing behind them because of specific life situations in which they were genuinely in danger and so having someone behind them is terrifying so they always protect their back in that context but if someone is very closed off holding their arms in front of them like folding their arms or constantly protecting themselves in that kind of way with that body language you're right it is more so verbally people insulting them to their face and so it's more of that like emotionally like withdrawn or distant or protected kind of deal that is so crazy that they went to that effort to include that. And something else is since we're just talking about like body language and framing, when Shigure started talking about Akito, the way the scene was framed with Yuki was really, really interesting to me because he had that closed off body language, but we only saw his back. The way the shadow was hitting is the shadow was only hitting his head when they were talking about Akito, which kind of, in my mind, showed how when you bring up Akito, it takes his head to a very dark place, you know? Whoa. Because there's so much trauma built up from that. Just in general, that relationship with Akito in the darkness is very like heavily imbued within Yuki. The fact that they visually represented that, which it's Fruits Basket, I have very few doubts in my mind that it was intentional. <laughs> like, it definitely was. I think it's so cool and it's so nuanced and I love it. That's so cool. And then the next note that I have is Yuki talking to Toru about the curse when they're in the classroom and they have that whole mm -hmm. run-in where he wants to know if she had 
given the secret away to her friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This and scene is so good. It's, I feel like it's almost one of the most iconic from season one. It shows how, it, from my perspective at least, how like worried he is and how much like the memories of his friends being wiped from when he was younger still bothers him. And how the idea of Toru saying that if my memory does get wiped, promise me that you'll be friends with me again. It shakes the boy to his core. Yeah. Oh. And then you also get that first little nugget or like foreshadowing that Yuki and the other Zodiacs can't go against Akito because he's talking mm-hmm. about how if Toru's memories get wiped, then he can't do anything about it. He has to just yeah. accept it. And he seems really yeah. conflicted about it. And when you watch it the first time, you think, oh, it's just because Akito's the family head, so they have to follow what the family head says. And it's so much deeper than that once you know what the curse actually is, that it's the bond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we see to a certain extent that it's not true. Because in the most recent episode from season two, or one of them, I can't remember exactly, he actively defies Akito. I think it's the second to last episode in season two. He actively defies Akito and gets beat up for it. But Mm -hmm. then he's like, hey, Mama Toru, can I have like props for that? Like I defy God. Yeah. One thing that I have to just, I don't know, throw it back to is when Momiji and Toru were talking during the Momiji and Momo episode and Toru Mm -hmm. said that she wanted to go see Kureno. And Momiji said, oh, we can't go see Kureno. The Zodiacs aren't allowed. Or wait, Mm -hmm. maybe that's just what Akito has been telling us, but we really could go see him. And then Momiji ends up going and seeing Kureno. So that was him rebelling. And it was the first time that we, that I can think of right now, that we really saw that happen, that act of Mm -hmm. disobedience. And also that like nothing happened because of it. So I think that after that moment, we just started seeing more and more disobedience and they were realizing, wait, that's just what Akito told us. We could actually mm. go do it and nothing will happen. But yeah. like, that's what what she told us to do. And I almost feel like it's more of an inclination to obey as opposed to like a mandate, I guess. Like it's almost the Zodiac spirit like inside them telling them to like follow God almost like two conflicting spirits inside them, kind of like duking it out. Like, do I follow God? Do I not? You know? Oh, like when Yuki met Akito for the first time and like yeah. part of him was saying, I want to run, but I want to hug you, but I want to cry, but I'm so yes. happy. Okay. So I don't think that it's like they are physically like locked in, brainwashed into having to do exactly what Akito says when Akito says it. But because there's that inner conflict between their own spirit, like their human spirit and their zodiac animal spirit, they feel inclined to go towards Akito and obey Akito just to like let that inner turmoil subside, I guess. Okay. Oh, and then I have one other note from this scene. So Toru fixes Yuki's tie, which is really cute because Yuki can't do his tie. And then by the end of season one, he ends up throwing Mm. it back to this moment and saying, I can tie my tie a little straighter, which is really cute. Oh, I forgot about that. Did you forget about that? It's so adorable. But Toru does say that she has a knack for neckties. And we know that her dad passed away when she was really young. And she has no reason that I can think of right now, living alone in an apartment with her mother and only having female friends, to know how to tie neckties. Maybe it's because of her grandpa or her cousin or whatever, but like... I think it has to be her grandpa. I guess like, so. Maybe he has arthritis. She lived for him like a for like a baby bit, right? Yeah, I just thought it was so funny that she's like, I have a knack for neckties. And I'm like, you only lived with your grandpa for a couple months there, girl. Like, (laughs) Yeah, but she's like on it when someone needs help. That's very true. If he had very like, um, like messed up fingers, like maybe he had arthritis or something. I don't really have any (laughs) proof of that. But like, maybe he did. And he needed help tying his tie. 
Toru would be on that. She would know how to tie, like, a freaking Windsor knot or something. That's true. Like, in a day. Yuki mentioned that he liked gardening, and then Kyo mentioned that he liked fighting, and she immediately went out and bought books to learn more about how to talk to them. So, you know, I would buy that. I would so buy that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it feels very in character for Toru, especially if it was her grandpa. That's very true. Okay, there you go. See, I was gonna call something out and you just gave me lots of <laughs> in-universe proof. I'll take it. <laughs> hey. So after that, the next thing that I kind of have written down that really piqued my interest is the Shigure and Akito scene. Okay. It was real brief. They were sitting next to each other. I think it was right after Yuki said, what are you two scheming? Or something along those lines. And it really struck me because do you know what kind of bird landed on Akito's finger? Oh, you don't have to ask me. <laughs> it was a sparrow. It was a sparrow, and that sparrow flew away. I know that this is so, like, <laughs> minute, but, like, having the sparrow fly away almost makes me feel like, in a way, it's foreshadowing that <laughs> Kareno flew away. Like, so minorly, but just, like, why else include a sparrow? Well, I mean, sparrows do symbolize other things. Like, when we talked about in the Kareno episode, the season finale, they are symbolic of things like longevity and luck and love and things like that. And Toru does bring a lot of that to them. They're discussing Toru. It might make sense to a certain degree. Sparrows are also like a really popular bird in Japan. But symbolically, I could definitely see this being tied to Kreno. I could definitely see it being a symbol of Toru because I think that they've used birds to symbolize her in the past. So, well, I guess in the future, because season two, but... You know well, I mean. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. It could it could be about Toru being a positive force. It could be about Kareno. It could be about a couple things. This scene, I completely forgot about it. I do kind of have it in my head that Shigure has a thing for Akito and kind of wants the best for Akito. I think that he's kind of jealous of Koreno, you know? Still can't figure out why Akito kept Toru around. And, cause, uh, wasn't it Akito who said it could be good for Kyo and Yuki? Oh god, my memory is so bad. I think? I think. Yeah. Yeah. Like, in yeah, that episode, was. like, it could be good for them. It feels distinctly out of character unless Akito thinks that Toru would build them up and that would allow Akito to break them down in the future. It just... It feels strange. I don't know. I can't read this scene. I know that there's a lot to it. Like, this ha I feel like that scene is very important. <laughs> Rubbing my hands but together. <laughs> I can't, I can't quite, I don't know. There's a, there's one puzzle piece missing that if I had it, I feel like I would get it, you know? Or maybe I already have all the pieces I need, but I just, they don't look like they fit. I don't know. Looks like you'll have to keep watching. <laughs> we'll just have to rewatch the show over and over until you figure it out. Is that a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> or just wait till season three and then tell me. No, 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 no. Let's rewatch it over and over again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, the next note that I have. Timeline time. Because I know that you have a theory on this. And I hope to God that you remember it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because you forget your theories all the time. Don't even get me started. Okay. My <laughs> note is that... Usually they're just kind of off the top of the head. Honestly, and yeah. And then that I have to work. remind you. <laughs> Okay, my note is that Kyo stopped going to school because he was going to that all-boys school and was in the mountains for yes. four months. So right now uh, we're yes. in September. Yes. I know what theory you're talking about, yes. Okay. I assume the theory that you're talking about is why was he in the mountains for four months, right? Yes. Well, this ties into something that we were talking about earlier in the podcast <laughs> and it's that I think that he witnessed the death of Kyoko. I think he was there for it. 
like 100% there for it. I think he even gets flashbacks of like her dying at some point in the show. So I feel like that's essentially confirmed that he was there, but maybe not. I think right after that, because that happened pretty recently. It's not like Toru's been in a tent um, living with her grandpa for like two years. It's been, everything is relatively fresh. So I'm pretty sure those two things happened at really similar times. And so it makes sense that he saw her die. He ran into the mountains because he blames himself, feels the guilt of that moment and places her death squarely on his own shoulders, which sends him into a deep depression. Cue the motivational Kazuma Kyo scene where he's very self-deprecating and essentially implying that he shouldn't be on this earth, if I recall correctly, and Kazuma trying to bring him back. And then he runs to Akito, does the thing, breaks the roof, and then he meets Kyoko's daughter. So next on my notebook is, when Kyo and Yuki are talking, Yuki mentions something really interesting. He says that he wants one foot out of the Soma cage, which is why he went to this co-ed school, right? Mm -hmm. I like this because he is preaching to the choir here because Kyo is going to be locked up in a cage. That's what Kyo actively has on his mind right now is beating Yuki so he doesn't have to be locked in a cage. And so it probably frustrates and upsets him that he hears Yuki saying, I want to get out of the Soma cage when it's like, you don't even know. Like you don't even get it. Like I'm the one who is going to literally be in a cage. You're just in a proverbial cage, which uh, not to downplay Yuki's situation. He is very much tied deeply by these bonds and the emotional and mental cage that he is in is tremendous, especially at this point in the story. But from Kyo's perspective, he's probably like, you don't get it, Yuki. You say these things, but you don't have it that bad. Okay, so next thing is when Kyo is talking to Shigure and they're talking about how Kyo doesn't know how to talk to Toru and it's a whole situation because mm -hmm. he keeps insulting her. And mm -hmm. Shigure says, you can break a table with one punch, but you can also stop that punch. And it's because of your training and talking to people requires training just like that. So I feel like that's such good foreshadowing for later in season two in the beach arc when Kyo goes up to Yuki and he's going to like punch him in the face because he's mad about having to go see Akito and all that nonsense, but he stops the punch and then he goes to talk to Akito. And then from the emotional mm -hmm. standpoint of like training to talk to people, he gets so much better at talking to Toru. And we'll see throughout season one where he'll start to like stop the punch when he's going to insult her. And mm -hmm. he'll like get himself all riled up and like take a deep breath in like he's just gonna like yell at her or call her an idiot or something like that. And then he'll sit back down and like take a breath out. And by mm -hmm. season two, he's just like, full on googly eyes over this girl, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, and he's, he is so emotionally intelligent in regard to Toru specifically, like able to pick up on her tics and he's so patient and kind and, oh, and they're just perfect together. But like seeing that evolution, it really makes me appreciate how much character development in season one and the very beginning of season two, Kyo gets. Yes. Because we're back at the beginning now. You're seeing him when he's all yelly. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Oh boy. But this next scene of him going to walk Toru back and she doesn't know it's him and they have this whole run in. It's so Ugh. cute. I. Literally, my only note is Kyoru, just pure Kyoru, because this moment is just so perfect of Toru finally getting to tell the cat that she's always wanted to be the cat, and that she wants to be friends with him, and that she really, really likes him, and yeah. that she's just hoping that they can have something, because she thinks that he hates her, and he yeah. just doesn't know how to talk to her, <laughs> and it's just so much for my tiny heart. Yeah, it's so... It's 
this, let's be honest, this is the moment that I knew that they were going to end up together. I guess that's not confirmed yet, but like, come on. Like, it's confirmed. <laughs> because like, even here, like, the, this is the most, <laughs> if I had to pick out like a moment that was like, cliche to a fault of this show, in a amazing way don't get me wrong but it's like when he hears the voice of shigure saying you'll find a girl who loves you in the back of his head <laughs> and then it's toru right there it's just like guys you ain't slick like <laughs> we know <laughs> but like it's not like it's trying to be hidden either mm -hmm. you know got that foreshadowing so I love it. I love it. I love it. But it's so like, it's not even like foreshadowing. It's like hitting you over the head with a shovel. <laughs> that being said, at this point in the show, I did want Yuki to end up with Toru. So hindsight's 2020. Uh, you're right. You, <laughs> you did want that. <laughs> I did want that. But now he is in love with Machi and that's all I care about. All right, that's all I had. Are we good to wrap it up? That's all I had, too. The only other thing that I wanted to say is the hat foreshadowing is very firm in these first two episodes. <laughs> yeah, they want you to be like, what is this hat? What's going on with the hat? Wait, the hat? And then and then Kyo, the Kyo, oh, Kyo's, it's Kyo's hat. That's it. The, the hat. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's amazing. Oh, I didn't what put they that together. <laughs> that's not at all. <laughs> when I thought, first started watching the show, I was like, why does she have a hat? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, like, why do we care about this hat? <laughs> like, maybe someone more astute would have picked that up. <laughs> but I was just like, okay, a blue hat. But that's all I have. Okie dokie. Well, I guess since that's all that we have, that'll do for this week's episode of our Fruits Basket podcast. So, if you like this kind of content, you want to keep seeing it on this channel, make sure to like the video, subscribe, and why not even ring that notification bell so you never miss another upload. And make sure you share this video wherever you share things because it helps us so incredibly much. But as always, we hope you have a fantastic rest of your day, a fantastic rest of your week, and why not even a fantastic rest of your month. And we will see you in the next video. Later. See ya.